So good evening. I'd like to thank you for coming to the Author Talk with award-winning author Rebecca Mackay. And while we're at it, let's also give her a warm congratulations for recently being named a finalist with the Vermont Book Award. Yes. We are so thrilled to host Rebecca here tonight to talk about her fabulous novel, The Great Believers, which is currently on our bestseller table and has been a staff pick uh, here at, the, at Bear Pond Books by multiple staff members. And the book has won multiple awards, including a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, winner of the Andrew Carnegie Medal, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction, winner of the Stonewall Book Award, and shortlisted for the National Book Award. And as I mentioned, now the finalist for the Vermont Book Award. That's the only one that matters. The only one that matters. <laughs> this is an important novel not only because of its pioneering subject matter, healthcare prejudices, bias and homophobia, the AIDS epidemic, art and prestige, and cults, but because there is much to admire in the style of writing and masterful storytelling Rebecca employs to deliver such complicated and tragic themes. You will be instantly transported into this tale, into both Chicago and Paris, and the threads that pull these two cities and the two main characters together. If you haven't read this book already, I urge you to pick up a copy tonight. Um, they're at the front counter. It's perfect for a beach read. And Rebecca will sign books after the talk. The talk will be about an hour, beginning with Kelly Arbor from Vermont Cares. Then Rebecca will speak and read an excerpt from The Great Believers. Then we will have audience Q&A. You're welcome to ask questions of our author and our speaker, Kelly. Then we'll do book signing and snacks. We have cookies, <laughs> seltzer, and water. I'd like to thank Orca Media for filming tonight's event. And I'd like to let you know that you can sign up for our newsletter to learn about our upcoming events. Thank you. Um, we have Susan Ritz's book launch. Yes, Susan. Hi, Susan. For A Dream to Die For. This uh, happy book birthday to this book today. It just came out today, and the event is next Tuesday. Congratulations, Susan. So we hope to see you all back here in one week for Susan's book launch. And then the next week, everybody has to come back for Micaiah Bay Galt's book launch event on July 30th. Kind of full of authors for you tonight, Rebecca. <laughs> I don't know how that happens in our amazing little town. Rebecca Mackay is the author of The Borrower, The Hundred Year House, which won the Novel of the Year Award from the Chicago Writers Association, and Music for Wartime. Her work has appeared in the Best American Short Stories, Harper's, and Tin House, among others. I think one of her biggest fans is Mario here, if everybody hasn't seen, <laughs> seen Mario. She lives outside Chicago and in Vermont with her husband and two daughters. Kelly Arbor is the testing and education manager at Vermont Cares, the largest AIDS service organization in the state. Vermont Cares provides a variety of harm reduction services throughout Vermont, including case management for HIV positive people, free HIV and hep C testing, syringe support services, and community and school prevention education. Kelly is also a queer and trans person living with HIV and loves bringing the peer-to-peer -peer elements of change artistry to the work. Please help me welcome Kelly Arbor. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's incredible to see a turnout like this. Um, I love Bear Pond books, and it's just awesome to see when art and activism come together. When I started reading Rebecca's book, I immediately was like, oh my gosh, I love these people. I'm already connected to these characters. And for me, as somebody who's HIV positive and also an AIDS survivor, I was dying of AIDS in 2010. 
And we know treatment's gotten better. Like, treatment's gotten way better since 1985. But with that, visibility has gone way down, and we've stopped talking about HIV. And for me, that's a real, like, danger sign. And Rebecca's book gives us something to take forward because we're also losing this generation of elders. And we've already lost so many of this generation of elders, and it's really the trauma and sadness and pain that that generation experienced is still prolifically in our communities and for young people not to access our elders now and i'm 42 i'm not that young um, <laughs> but seeing that connection and having story that brings that on i feel like is such an act and a gift of activism by rebecca to our community and i really 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 appreciate just your voice and the bit the, the writing was incredible um, and for me as a as a worker what I see still is the stigma is still there and it's still dominating all of the transcape it's keeping people from getting tested it's keeping people from accessing syringe services so they have to reuse needles or share syringes and it's just keeping people at risk and in the dark about really accessing their own risk factors so Books like this are so valuable and CARES, we do a lot of different stuff through the state and part of what we do is give out thousands and thousands and thousands of barriers. So I brought lots of condoms. Thank you Bear Pond for letting me do that. <laughs> and also some brochures and stuff on our services and we, we love to serve the community in whatever way that we can and something that we're constantly doing now is giving out Narcan which is an overdose reversal spray. So even if you're not currently using we are all in community with people that are using, and it's a really great thing just to have on hand, just in case. So um, I just want to note that, and thank you, Rebecca, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I think I'm going to try to stand up here just so I can see more of you and see the dog, because it's very important to me. Um, but I'm hoping that Kelly can join our conversation at the end a little bit as well as we do Q&A. That would be really lovely. Um, so I'm so glad to be here. I've, um, I've been coming to Bear Pond um, for years. Um, so I, I live part of the year in Chicago and part of the year in Vermont. And um, I live in Leicester, which I've discovered is a town that like 10% of Vermonters know where it is. Um, if you've ever driven down Route 7 and past the giant gorilla that's holding a Volkswagen Beetle on its hand, that's Leicester. It's the one landmark in Leicester. <laughs> Um, so that's where we live part of the year, including right now. So um, I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, I'm going to read a couple of different sections um, from this book. And then I'm really mostly excited to talk to you um, and also to pet the dog. But I did that a little bit already. <laughs> Wait a little bit longer. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to read to you from the end of the very first chapter of this book. And then I'm going to read to you from way later in the book, but without including a lot of spoilers. Be very careful about that. Um, so the, the Great Believer starts in 1985. Um, there is, my main character is a guy named Yale Tishman, who is a development director for an art gallery outside of Chicago. Um, and we're starting at the funeral, or actually the memorial service, of his first close friend to die of AIDS. So the fall of 85, it's November of 85, um, it, just to situate you historically, if it's not fresh in your memory, um, the test for what we now know as HIV had just become available, but was not available everywhere. And some of the biggest healthcare providers in Chicago were still debating whether they wanted to offer that or not. Um, for many reasons, you know, do, you find out you're negative, does that cause you to have risky behavior? You find out you're positive, do you become suicidal? Do you trust the test? Could the test results be subpoenaed and used against you by a government that did not have your best interests at stake? Um, so that's happening. Tens of thousands of people dead in the US from AIDS and Ronald Reagan still has not said the word AIDS in public. Um, and that's basically where we are. Um, so Yale's friend who has uh, passed away is Nico. This is a memorial service because his lover and friends have not been invited to the actual funeral. Um, and they're at the house of a wealthy friend of theirs named Richard. 
And right when this starts, we are, um, there's about to be a slideshow of Nico's life. Yil couldn't bear to join, and although he wouldn't be the only one crying, he didn't think he could stay here. He backed out of the crowd and took a few steps up Richard's stairs, watching the heads from above. Everyone stared at the slides, riveted. Nico in running shorts, a number pinned to his chest. Nico and Terrence leaning against a tree, both giving the finger. Nico in profile with his orange scarf and black coat, a cigarette between his lips. There was Yell himself, tucked in the crook of Charlie's arm, Nico on the other side. The year end paper last December, the year end party last December for Charlie's paper. Nico and Nico laughing at Julian and Teddy, the Halloween they had dressed as Sunny and Cher. Nico opening a present. Nico holding a bowl of chocolate ice cream. Nico up close, teeth shining. The last time Yale saw Nico, he'd been unconscious with foam, some kind of awful white foam oozing suddenly from his mouth and nostrils. Terrence had screamed into the hallway for the nurses, had run into a cleaning cart and hurt his knee, and the fucking nurses were more concerned about whether Terrence had shed blood than about what was happening to Nico. And here on the slide was Nico's full, beautiful face, and it was too much. Yale dashed up the rest of the stairs. The first bedroom was empty. He closed the door and sat on the bed. It was dark out now, the sparse streetlights of Belden just barely illuminating the walls and floor. He put his glass down and lay back to stare at the ceiling and do the slow breathing trick Charlie had taught him. All fall, he'd been memorizing the list of the gallery's regular donors. Tuning out the downstairs noise, he did what he often did at home when he couldn't sleep. He named donors starting with A, one starting with B. Recently, he'd found the lists disconcerting, had felt a dull gray uneasiness around them. He remembered being eight and asking his father who else in the neighborhood was Jewish. Are the Rothmans Jewish? Are the Andersons? And his father rubbing his chin, saying, let's not do that, buddy. Historically, bad things happen when we make lists of Jews. It wasn't till years later that Yale realized this was a hang-up unique to his father, his brand of self-loathing. But Yale had been young and impressionable, and maybe that's why the reciting of names chafed. Or no, maybe it was this. Lately, he'd had two parallel mental lists going, the donor list and the sick list the people who might donate art or money, and the friends who might get sick. The big donors, the ones whose names you'd never forget, and the friends he'd already lost. But they weren't close friends, the lost ones, until tonight. They'd been acquaintances, friends of friends, like Nico's old roommate Jonathan, a couple of gallery owners, one bartender, the bookstore guy. There were, what, six? Six people he knew of, people he'd say hi to at a bar, people whose middle names he couldn't tell you and maybe not even their last names. He'd been to three memorials, but now a new list, one close friend. Yale and Charlie had gone to an informational meeting last year with a speaker from San Francisco. He'd said, I know guys who've lost no one, groups that haven't been touched, but I also know people who've lost 20 friends, entire apartment buildings devastated. And Yale, stupidly, desperately, had thought maybe he'd fall into that first category. It didn't help that through Charlie, he knew practically everyone in Boys Town. It didn't help that his friends were all overachievers and that they seemed to be overachieving in this terrible new way as well. How had Yale forgotten he hated rum? They were drinking Cuba Libres at the party because Nico's Park Cuban. It always made him moody, dehydrated, hot, his stomach a mess. He found a closet-sized bathroom off this room and sat on the cool toilet, head between his knees. Okay, he thinks for a while there about a lot of stuff that is important to the book, but not to this particular reading, so I'm going to skip it. All right. And then there was the list of acquaintances already sick, hiding the lesions on their arms, but not their faces, coughing horribly, growing thin, waiting to get worse, or lying in the hospital, or flown home to die near their parents, to be written up in their local papers as having died of pneumonia. Just a few right now, but there was room on that list. When Yale finally moved again, it was to cup water from the sink, splash it over his face. He looked frightful in the mirror, 
rings under his eyes, skin gone pale olive. His heart felt funny, but then his heart always felt funny. The slideshow must be over, and if he could look down on the crowd, he'd be able to spot Charlie. They could make their escape. They could get a cab even, and he could lean on the window. He opened the door to the hall and heard a collective silence, as if they were all holding their breath, listening to someone make a speech. Only he couldn't quite hear the speech. He looked down, but there was no one in the living room. They'd moved somewhere. He came downstairs slowly, not wanting to be startled. A sudden noise would make him vomit. But down in the living room was just the horror of the record spinning past the last song, the needle arm retired to the side. Beer bottles and Cuba Libre glasses, still half full, covered the tables and couch arms. The trays of canapes had been left on the dining table. Yil thought of a raid, some kind of police raid, but this was a private residence, and they were all adults, and nothing much illegal had happened. Probably someone had some pot, but come on. How long had he been upstairs? Maybe 20 minutes, maybe 30. He wondered if he could have fallen asleep on the bed, if it was 2 a.m. now. But no, not unless his watch had stopped. It was only 5.45. He was being ridiculous, and they were out in the backyard. Places like this had backyards. He walked through the empty kitchen, through a book-lined den. There was the door, but it was deadbolted. He cupped his hand to the glass, a striped canopy, a heap of dead leaves, the moon, no people. Yell turned and started shouting, hello, Richard, guys, hello. He went to the front door, also bizarrely deadbolted, and fumbled till it opened. There was no one on the dark street. The foggy, ridiculous idea came to him that the world had ended, that some apocalypse had swept through and forgotten only him. He laughed at himself, but at the same time, he saw no bobbing heads in neighbors' windows. There were lights in the houses opposite, but then the lights were on here too. He hoped for a siren, a horn, a dog, an airplane across the night sky, nothing. He went back inside and closed the door. He yelled again, you guys. And he felt now that a trick was being played, that they might jump out and laugh. But this was a memorial, wasn't it? It wasn't the 10th grade. People weren't always looking for ways to hurt him. He found his own reflection in Richard's TV. He was still here, still visible. On the back of a chair was a blue windbreaker he recognized as Asher glasses, the pockets empty. He should leave, but where would he even go? He walked through every room on the ground floor, opening every door, pantry, coat closet, vacuum closet, until he was greeted with a wall of cold air and descending cement steps. He found the light switch and made his way down. Laundry machines, boxes, two rusty bikes. He climbed back up and then all the way to the third floor, a study, a little weight room, some storage, and then down to the second again and opened everything. Ornate mahogany bureaus, canopy beds, a master bedroom all white and green. A Diane Arbus print on the wall, the one of the boy with the hand grenade. A telephone sat next to Richard's bed and Yale grabbed it with relief. He listened to the tone, reassuring, and slowly dialed his own number. No answer. He needed to hear a voice, any human voice, and so he got the dial tone back and called information. Name and city, please, the woman said. Hello? He wanted to make sure she wasn't a recording. This is information. Do you know the name of the person you wish to call? Yes, it's Marcus. Nico Marcus on North Clark in Chicago. He spelled the names. I have an N Marcus on North Clark. Would you like me to connect you? No, no thank you. Stay on the line for the number. Yell hung up. He circled the house one more time and went finally to the front door. He called to no one, I'm leaving, I'm going, and stepped out into the dark. Okay, so the world has not ended because there are 300 more pages. Um, I read this once um, at a writer's conference and a very young writer in the audience came up to me afterwards tremendously excited because she thought I was writing sci-fi and she thought they had all been spirited away by aliens or something else. It was very sad to disappoint her. 
Um, okay, I'm going to read one more medium section and then a very short section. So um, I, when I was on tour for the hardcover, I wasn't reading this section. And then most of my paperback tour was this June, which, um, as I hope you know, was the 50th anniversary of the original Pride, of, of the original Stonewall Riot. And I have a chapter here about the 1986 Chicago Pride Parade. Um, and so I started reading this when I was on the road for the paperback, and I really enjoyed reading it. Um, the one spoiler in this chapter is that Yale has broken up with his boyfriend, Charlie, which, if you read 20 pages in, will not shock you because Charlie is a piece of work. So that's what's happening. Um, and I'll fill you in on anything else as we go that you need to know. Oh, I know the one thing. Um, um, he's kind of, as a result of his breakup, had a falling out with a number of his friends. Don't worry about the details, but that's been happening. And then um, in 1986, Harold Washington was the mayor of Chicago. He was the first African-American mayor of a major American city um, and was actually really sympathetic to LGBTQ causes. Um, a lot of people in Chicago would tell you that's because he himself was gay um, and, and closeted. Um, and he was really, had one of the best mayoral responses to the epidemic, and then he died quite suddenly a year later of a heart attack in office. And we got Richard Daley II, who eventually came around but needed to be brought around by activism and by specifically the Chicago chapter of ACT UP. So there was some rough going for a while. Um, there had been some Klan activity in the park. I can't remember what even comes up in here. Oh, um, Asher Glass, whose jacket Yale found in the first chapter, he just has a burning crush on him that he's never going to act on, and he's mentioned in here. All right. Um, so this is the 1986 Pride Parade. By the time he got to Clark, the route was packed, and the first few floats had gone by. He found his way behind people looking for someone he recognized. After two blocks, he spotted Katsu Tatami across the street. And when a few people ran across behind the Anheuser-Busch float, he crossed too. He didn't know the guys Katsu was standing with, but Katsu was always good for a hug, an enthusiastic greeting. He had to shout in Yale's ear, so far so good, you want my soda? He thrust a McDonald's cup at Yale, and a thought about germs flashed across Yale's mind, but he willfully ignored it. He took a sip and then wished he hadn't, warm, flat sugar water. A bunch of Harleys rolled past, followed by a lesbian dojo, women kicking and chopping their way down the street dressed in white. Miss Gay Wisconsin, earnest middle-aged women with P-flag signs, a huge brass bed pulled by a convertible and occupied by two men making out with tremendous gusto, their torsos bare above a thin white sheet. Um, my research on the 1986 Chicago Pride Parade was YouTube-based, and it was fabulous. <laughs> Yale asked Katsu how he was, and Katsu said, I'm becoming a legal expert. He explained, shouted, that he'd gotten new insurance two years ago. In January, he was feeling terrible and finally got tested, and he had it. Did Yale know? Yeah, son of a bitch, he hadn't even told his mom. And his goddamn insurance was trying to claim that the virus was a pre-existing condition so they wouldn't have to cover it. Even though I got the insurance before the fucking test came out, but they're claiming I should have known because three years ago I was treated for thrush one time, and that's enough for them to turn me down. He needed pentamidine treatments, and he needed hospital care that wasn't at fucking county where he'd been a couple of times, and was Yale aware what it smelled like in there? There was a reason it was free. So Asher was helping him apply for social security he had to have before he could get Medicaid because apparently that was how things worked in this stupid country. And do you know what I have to prove? Okay, this is insane. We have to prove I'm disabled, which I am now, because I could work maybe four days a week, but the fifth day I get the run so bad I'm glued to the bathroom floor. This was tenable for his part-time gig at Howard Brown, but not for the administrative assistant work that used to pay the bills and supply the useless insurance. But the runs aren't a disability category, I guess. So Asher's finding me this junior litigator, and here's what he has to prove at his hearing. He has to show that I can't do any unskilled sedentary labor in the national economy, like the entire nation. And the examples they use, you wanna hear the examples? Yale was exhausted just listening to Katsu, but sure, he wanted to hear. A drag queen passed on stilts in an elaborate Statue of Liberty costume, all green sparkles and gauze. I shit you not, nut sorter. That's not a euphemism, by the way. <laughs> Bowling ball polisher. 
Also not a euphemism. <laughs> silverware wrapper, like sitting there wrapping silverware in napkins. Everyone wants their spoons handled by a guy with the AIDS runs, right? <laughs> Wafer topper. I don't even know what that means. The last one, for real, is fish hook inspector in Alaska. They don't care that I can't get to Alaska and I could never get this job. They care that it's a job in the national economy. So yeah, my survival now depends on my proving I can't top wafers. Here came a bunch of guys in leather, a poster that read bound up with pride. Some kind of garden club followed. But I'm gonna get in on whatever clinical trials I can. And Asher's helping, he all said. Yeah, Asher, he can sort my nuts whenever he wants, am I right? <laughs> Yale felt his face catch fire. Oh, come on, you'd let him polish your bowling balls. <laughs> Yale attempted a non-committal laugh. And here, ridiculously, before he could properly recover was Asher's AFC float. Here was Asher waving like a politician. Yale waved, but he didn't catch Asher's, catch Asher's eye. Three guys on unicycles came next, cutoffs and Dunham vests a series of aldermen and some state senators in convertibles, most looking pained. Okay, so um, I'm gonna skip a little bit. He's hanging out with his friend Teddy, a different friend. Teddy is a kind of um, a little bit tiresome philosophy PhD candidate, and they are hanging out in the park um, afterwards. There was no point trying to move till the parade was over, and when it finally was, they followed the crowd to the park for the rally. Katsu took off, and Yale found him alone with Teddy in an endless line for food. Yale found himself alone with Teddy in an endless line for food. Yale said, I hope we're still friends. I was mad at you, Teddy said, but it was temporary. I was judging you for being judgmental. Ironic, right? The line lurched, and Yale checked to make sure the guys behind them were strangers. He said, I feel like we're caught up in some huge cycle of judgment. We spend our whole lives unlearning it, and here we are. The thing is, Teddy said, this disease itself feels like a judgment. We've all got a little Jesse Helms on our shoulder, right? If you got it from sleeping with a thousand guys, then it's a judgment on your promiscuity. If you got it from sleeping with one guy once, that's almost worse. It's like a judgment on all of us. Like the act itself is the problem and not the number of times you did it. And if you got it because you thought you couldn't, it's a judgment on your hubris. And if you got it because you knew you could and you didn't care, it's a judgment on how much you hate yourself. Isn't that why the world loves Ryan White? How could God have it out for some poor kid with a blood disorder? But then people are still being terrible. They're judging him just for being sick, not even the way he got it. Yell tended to find Teddy mentally draining, but this time he was right. Way over at the bandstand, Mayor Washington had begun to speak. As a black man who has suffered discrimination, he was saying, as part of a race of people who have suffered, and Teddy said, he's a good one, yeah? We lucked out. Okay, so the very last thing I will read you. So, um, if you don't know the book, every other chapter, um, and they're much shorter chapters, um, it's a much finer thread going through the novel, is 2015 Paris. And Nico, whose memorial that was at the beginning, his little sister Fiona is in Paris in 2015. Um, you don't need to worry for this reading about why she's there, but she's there. And she's staying with that same friend whose house it was in Chicago at the beginning, this guy Richard. He's a photographer. And when she first got there, he was trying to show her some photos um, of her brother and his friends back in the day, but she wasn't ready to look at them. She's alone in the apartment now, and she thinks she's ready. And the one thing you need to know about Fiona for this is that in her adult life, her job is that she manages a resale shop that benefits AIDS housing, loosely based on a place in Chicago called the Brown Elephant, but fictionalized. There were probably 20 albums on the shelf, a fact Fiona hadn't absorbed that first day. Rows of black leather, brown leather, colored canvas. When she pulled a thick red album off the shelf, though, a paper slipped out and landed on the floor. Fiona attempted to clutch the album closed before anything else fell, but she dropped the whole thing, and now there were papers everywhere. Cream-colored sheets folded in half, small cards, a lavender page with a grainy photo of a man. They were funeral bulletins and prayer cards. She got on her knees and started stacking them. 
This wasn't a photo album at all, she saw, when she opened it to an old clipping from Out Loud Chicago, an obituary of someone who danced with the Alvin Ailey Theater. Jesus. She opened the album at the beginning and tried to slide the papers back into the empty spots. A man named Oscar, no one she remembered, had died in 1984. A clipping about Katsu Tatami from 1986. Here was the bulletin for Terrence Robinson, Nico's Terrence. Jonathan Bird, Dwight Sumner. There were so impossibly many. In her current life, it happened at least once a week that someone would wander into the store and then, when they discovered its mission, say something like, oh, I remember that time. Fiona had learned to check her temper, to push her toes into the floor so her face didn't change. I knew someone whose cousin had it, they'd continue. Did you ever see Philadelphia? And they'd shake their heads in dismay. And how could she answer? They meant well, all of them. How could she explain that this city was a graveyard? That they were walking every day through streets where there had been a holocaust, a mass murder of neglect and antipathy. That when they stepped through a pocket of cold air, didn't they understand it was a ghost? It was a boy the world had spat out. Here in her hand, a stack of ghosts. All right, I'm gonna stop reading there and I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> So while you're thinking of questions to ask, because you think of questions to ask, I'm going to tell you something really quickly about the last passage I read, which is that um, that was inspired in a very um, kind of lateral way by um, most of the research that I did for this book was in-person interviews and archival research. I went into... Um, I went into this thinking that I could go to the big library downtown in Chicago and find the three or four big nonfiction books about AIDS in America's third largest city um, that might have been, um, you know, doctoral dissertations turned into books. I knew they would be boring. They did not exist um, at all. There are zero. Um, there is, since I was writing it, there's been one graphic memoir, like a memoir in comics put out by an AIDS nurse in Chicago about the early 90s. That is the only other book about AIDS in Chicago right now. Um, so um, that's problematic. Because um, I've written fiction. I have not written nonfiction. And we really need the nonfiction. But um, so that pushed me really quickly into archival research. Um, the Harold Washington Library in Chicago has back issues of the Windy City Times, which is our actual gay weekly. I made up fictional ones for this. Um, starting in 1985. So I read every back issue from 1985 to 1992, which was really interesting. Um, and then I did a, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews. I talked to doctors, nurses, lawyers, historians, archivists, activists, journalists, um, survivors, everyone I could talk to. And at one point, I sat down and I was talking to this guy named Bill McMillan. He had been really big in ACT UP in Chicago in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, those of you who've read the book or who happen to know Chicago AIDS history for some reason, um, I was writing late in the book about this major protest that took place in 1990 um, um, against the American Medical Association and the insurance companies headquartered in Chicago. And at a certain point in this protest, there are five guys who get out on this ledge of the county building. Um, they kind of infiltrated and they get out there and they unfurl this banner that says we demand equal health care now and they're dragged in very violently one by one um, and one of those guys actually two of those five guys have survived um, and one of them was this guy Bill McMillan who sat down to talk to me and I felt like I was talking to Paul Revere you know I've been studying this guy and seeing pictures of him and then he's here just sitting there talking to me in this booth in a restaurant and he brought photo albums which was amazing because, first of all, we're talking about a time when not every human has a camera on their body at all moments. Um, so photos are kind of a <laughs> precious thing. But also, you don't take a camera into a gay bar in 1987, right? Um, so photos were especially precious to me in this research process. And we looked through one photo album, and then he opened another. And when he opened it, he did not realize this was what it was, but it was actually a scrapbook. And these funeral bulletins kind of fell out all over the table. Um, and then I helped him reorganize them. 
The reason he had so many balloons crammed in there unorganized is that um, although he lived in Chicago, Bill was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Milwaukee has this uniquely devastating AIDS story, which when I was reading in Milwaukee, I told them and like only two people in the crowd knew, um, which is that in 1993, I believe, there was an outbreak in the water of cryptosporidium, this horrible bacteria. And there were about 68 people who died in Milwaukee in the course of a week. And what the news reported was that it was the elderly and those with compromised immunity. What it actually was was almost every single one of those people was someone living with HIV. The city of Milwaukee lost basically its entire HIV community within the span of a week. And he had driven up there for funeral after funeral, gotten these funeral buttons and crammed them in, and then hadn't really had much cause to open this album since then because things were on the upswing. Um, but um, part of what's been fascinating to me as I have toured and gone to different cities has been the completely different stories and the different responses of different states, different cities, um, we don't hear the stories of New York and San Francisco enough, but what we do hear tends to be New York and San Francisco. And, you know, those, those are certain responses. I'm sure Vermont has its own, you know, specific story. Dubuque, Iowa, I was on tour, and the last guy in the line, just an older guy, and he came up and he was like, yeah, I was the infectious diseases specialist here at one of the two hospitals. And he treated... You know, if you're a young gay man in the 80s in Dubuque, you probably leave and go to Chicago or Minneapolis. But when you get sick, you go home. And so he treated dozens of men in a vacuum. Um, so I've been so interested in those responses of different places. And my so one, of, one of my many soapboxes as a tour has been that those stories need to be told while people are still around who can tell those stories. So I have rambled for long enough that surely you've thought of questions by now. <laughs> Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. It always just takes someone to ask the first question. And you can ask it of Kelly or of me, either one. Or I could ask a question of Kelly. Should we do that? Let's start with that. What do you know? I, you know, my research was Chicago based. I don't know much about the history of AIDS in Vermont. Um, do you know some things that you could share with us about? the response here or does someone else know that you're pointing at instead? Like the executive director. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I would say Vermont right now is in a really lucky place um, in terms of how we've responded as a state to HIV. And that's because Vermont is unique and rural and we take care of each other. Yeah. Uh, we're one of the few states in the nation that can even consider a future with no HIV infections. Um, so we've been sort of working with all the community partners we can think of to expand HIV prevention, increase access to free testing, and really sort of focus prevention efforts so that we can take the very few cases that we have, and we should be proud of that, um, and really drive that toward no new infections. When we yeah. thought about it, our vision was, wait, we don't actually want any new infections. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then on top of that, Vermont really takes care of people with HIV, and everyone in this room should be proud of that, too. Um, we have an amazing medication program across the state that helps low-income people and even moderate-income people access those life-saving new medications Kelly was talking about. Yeah. And it's really impressive. Can you speak much to what was going on in the 80s or the early 90s? It was a incredibly grassroots in the beginning. Yeah. And I think we try to sort of cling to that um, model yeah. because it was so beautiful and caring. The stories told to me from the 80s HIV response here um, was just groups of friends and loved ones uh, volunteering in three hour shifts um, by the bedside of folks who were dying. Mm -hmm. And no, no paid staff, no, no infrastructure, just sort of a sign up sheet and yeah. taking that time with each other. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that's so beautiful and moving and, and what I want for everyone. Yeah, and actually, you know, when it, even in Chicago, that's basically what was happening, right? Like the the um, the AIDS unit that I write about a lot is Illinois at Illinois Masonic, which was a, one of the earliest models for an AIDS care unit in the world, and it was grassroots. It was these two doctors who started it, found a hospital that you know was sympathetic, and then local barbers who'd come in and do haircuts, and people who give massages, and restaurants that would give food, and 
an art therapist who would volunteer and these, yeah. Um, it was, that was the way it was happening, even in a major city. Yeah, do you have a question? Dr. Chang, was that based on a real person? I think yeah. it's an incredible character. Okay, now. yeah, so I... Consolidation. Yeah, basically a consolidation. Thank you for asking. It's, I, I, my, I think it might be my favorite character. There's this very minor character. It's this Dr. Dr. Chang um, that I have at Illinois Masonic. Um, I specifically, you know, I, I was in conversation with the doctors who started that unit, their nurses, the art therapist, all these people who'd been through that unit. And I wanted to find a character who could not be, you know, clearly t linked to any of them. Um, but the, the two things that I used to model his character, one was that the art therapist told me this, he said the thing that always got to him was watching the contrast between this chaplain who he really didn't like. I'm sure there were good chaplains out there. He didn't like this one chaplain who apparently would, um, be walking down the hall looking just fine and then compose herself to look sad before she walked into a room. And the doctors, and these were the two doctors that I knew that he was talking about who would be walking around looking devastated and bereft and hopeless, but would collect themselves and kind of put their shoulders back and put a smile on before they walked into the room. Um, and that was who I wanted Dr. Chen to be. And the other stories, and this is off the record, um, we're being recorded, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then in that case, I will say that the incident with the oxygen tank that is near the end of the novel might or might not be based on something that a real doctor might or might not have done. <laughs> so, um, but that was, that was it. And, and I also, I, I found, I kind of chose a name for him and then I went to the doctors, you know, Dr. David Moore and Dr. David Blatt, who are now married, they're partners at the time. Um, and I said, you know, was there anyone in Dr. Chang or Chang or anything close to it? And they're like, no. I was like, was there any Chinese American doctor? They're like, no. And I was like, is there, any, you know, I kind of was assured that it couldn't be, you know, linked to anyone. And then that became my doctor. So thank you for asking. Yes. Um, I have a few questions. You seem very young to have written so many books. You know, I'm only 20. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so one question is, how long did it take you to write this book? The other yeah. question, the other thing I wanted to mention is I read The Borrower after mm -hmm. this one, which I thought was awesome. I loved that book, and it also seemed, it had um, another character in there. It seemed mm -hmm. like you were tying in a lot of... Yeah, um, yeah. So, okay, so... Um, no, I'm not 20. <laughs> um, I'm 41. But um, I this book took me about four years, all told. Um, it's hard to figure out, you know, what do you count as writing time? For me, there's a lot of kind of stewing on a subject before I start to write. And then at the end, there's this weird period where it's out of your hands, but then you get edits, but then it's out of your hands, and then you get copy edits, but then it's out of your hands, and then you get the proofs, and then it's out of your hands. Are you writing that year? Does that count as writing? I don't know. But about four years, um, which was simultaneous writing and research. I was really, I didn't do the research and then write or the other way around. It was, they were kind of simultaneous. Um, and then, yeah, no, I, this is my fourth book. Um, my first book, a novel called The Borrower, has some sort of similar themes, vaguely, not about AIDS, but about um, a young boy who's been put into anti-gay therapy by his uh, very religious parents. Um, and, oh, that dog is so sweet. Um, <laughs> And um, so well, there's. I have to say, I love um, all the Vermont stuff. That you yeah, there's some Vermont stuff in there. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And my next novel is set in New Hampshire, which I don't know how I feel about that, but it's. <laughs> mm, um, <laughs> which is right across the border. <laughs> uh, but yes, that was Vermont was already a big part of my life at that point, so um, it, it was natural to put that into the book. Thank you. What else? Yeah. I know we're talking about the importance of uh, writing history down, but what <clears throat> what led you personally to kind of feel so passionate about this? Yeah. Um, okay. So I have this theory, and this has been as I've toured. The, you know, if you guys heard the question, you know, why, why, what me personally about this this subject. Um, honestly, in terms of this book, it started off somewhere else. Those of you who have read it, it started off with Nora. 
Um, this woman who's an artist model in 1920s Paris. Um, I wanted her looking back from the end of her life, which put her in the 80s. She's in the art world, so I had the art world in the 80s, and I felt like that was an opportunity to write about the AIDS epidemic, which is something I've been interested in for a long time. Um, there's My previous book is a short story collection, and there's a short story in there about the, sh the New York art world um, in the AIDS epidemic as well. Um, I really feel the more like I talk to other people. Uh, so I was born in 1978, for those of you who don't do instant subtraction. Um, and there's something, I think, about the period in which I was born, the narrow period, where we were, and you're, it sounds like you're close to my age, right? Um, it was the backdrop to my childhood in the way that the Vietnam War might have been the backdrop to the childhood of some people in the audience. Um, it was everything in the news. It wasn't enough in the news, but for the kids who were paying attention, you know, you stay home sick from school and you watch Donahue and that's what's on. <laughs> um, you, you know, and I was watching those things and I think where an adult would have an adult's learned sense of dismissal but that's happening to those people over there, crises come and go, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect me. And where teenagers might have been too absorbed in their own lives, younger kids were too young, there's this window where we were just porous. And this was coming at us at a time when, you know, however we identified, whether we were related to these guys, just thought they were great, had no connection to them at all, it just felt important. For me, um, I didn't have a huge connection in my own life. My, my parents lost one colleague. My parents were university professors. And my mom was very shaken, I remember, in my childhood by having gone on a road trip to a conference with a close friend who was a colleague. And he was feeling a little under the weather. And they drove across the country, they drove back, and then four days later she gets a call that he's died. And that was, I think that, you know, she just told me it wasn't, you know, I didn't know him, but I think that was enough for me to kind of go, oh, this is something I need to pay attention to. Um, and then, you know, I had a child's kind of poor sense of empathy. And so also, being our age, if you went to a really, if you went to a responsible high school, you got to high school in the early 90s, and all of sex ed was HIV AIDS. Um, and... Uh, you know, and all the assemblies and all that, you know, everything. Um, to me, it's, it's one of the lenses through which I have always seen the world. And I don't think I'm alone in that generationally. Um, it's been really interesting to me being on the road and hearing, you know, getting, depends where I am. Because I'll get, you know, women who are maybe in their 60s coming up and saying, I worked in theater in San Francisco. I lost all these friends. That's one story. I'll get women in their 60s coming up to me saying, I was raising my kids in the suburbs and I had no idea. Um, and I'll get younger people, younger gay men coming up saying, I didn't know, and then my older friend told me to read this book and watch this documentary and I'm trying to learn about it. Um, but um, I do think there's something generationally specific. And okay, so you're 42. Yeah. Do you feel, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Do you have any, I yeah. want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, totally. Okay. I mean, I, they brought the AIDS quilt to my high school. I, I grew up in rural Maine, um, Rumford, Mexico, and I remember the AIDS quilt coming to my high school and Ryan White's mother toured through Maine. I mean, being in a room with her speaking, like, changes who you are, but it didn't change my ability to protect myself. And because of the lack of queerness in all of the sex ed, because of the stigma targeted at who we assume is at risk for HIV and being a trans person and like, well, you're not gay, you're born a girl. It's like, there's so many layers of stigma mm -hmm. that I still hear the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable <laughs> that I'm hearing the same stuff 30, 40 years yeah. later. And it's really scary because I don't, I want people to have the information. It's almost like we've washed it out yeah. and we don't want to remember that's painful. Let's not talk about it. And that's not helping people, like, not get HIV. Like, yeah, Vermont's doing great, and we have great insurance and stuff, but we could really make stigma be addressed in our peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Mm -hmm. And I see that being our power, and I think we do have this 
power as the generation to keep talking about it and keep it moving so that it doesn't get washed out. And I, I do feel that like it really was on all of our radars, yeah. even mm -hmm. if we're like, what the heck does that mean? Yeah. It's like everywhere. Yeah. Well, and the two things I would say, you know, my high school, as incredible and responsible as it was, this was very much presented as an equal opportunity. So it was, it, the gay thing was very much kind of brushed under the rug. Like, this was going to happen among straight virgins somehow, which, you know, most of us were, like, they're just going to pop up um, without acknowledging, right? And that was a lot of, when I look back and I learn about ACT UP in Chicago, a lot of their activism was about um, you know, things like on the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority, um, they finally in the early 90s did a public education campaign with posters. Of course, they picture straight couples in these ads. And so what ACT UP did is they hung out at one intersection and every time a bus came through, they ran onto the bus and tore down the old posters and put up the new posters. <laughs> and then they, and then eventually they ended up lying down in the street and they got dragged. It was, it, it was kind of amazing, the footage I've seen of this. Um, and I would say also about you know, this being the time that you know, we, we do have survivors among us, survivors of the original battle who I will say, I've had the voices of these survivors in my ears for the past five years. These voices are what has gotten me through the past five years politically in this country. These, right, these, these people know how to fight. They know how to fight when they have everything to lose, when they have nothing left to lose. They know how to fight when they're exhausted. They know how to fight when they're sick. They know how to fight um, a losing battle. And, you know, they, so much of what we know about direct action is from ACT UP. And it works. Direct action works. That was one of the things that blew my mind because I was going, you know, I was going to the Women's March and then coming home and writing scenes of protest and learning that, you know, that 1990 ACT UP demonstration, one of the things they were fighting for was um, beds for women at Cook County Hospital, which specifically at that point in time was beds for black women at Cook County Hospital. It was the place you'd go if you had no insurance. And they had 15 vacant beds, but wouldn't allot any beds for women because of staffing. They got out there in the streets, 15 women threw mattresses down at this intersection and lay down on them. And two days later, they opened up 15 beds for women at Cook County. It worked within two days. It actually worked. And at a time when I was feeling like, you know, we're out there shouting and nothing is happening, which I still feel like, um, that was incredible for me to learn, to, to understand that it, it actually matters. And it matters most on the local level. You know, it matters when you can get in someone's face. It matters when you can embarrass someone on the news. Um, and that's what they were doing. They were, in, in Chicago, they were bringing Mayor Daly around by getting in his face every day. So, yeah. What else? Time for a couple more questions, I think, right? Are we doing... I'm looking at you because you look like you might be near a source of time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, where, where are we today in the U.S.? I mean, I hear that the largest growing number of AIDS... Um, cases are among black gay men in the South and that that's still so much stigma that they won't go for help and um, is what's being done about that and, and I guess in Indiana yeah. there's a growing number. It seems yeah. like, like you said, because it's hidden it's coming back again even though there's things like this extremely expensive prep. And right. How does this all it's, work? it's a very manageable disease if you happen to have excellent health care and insurance. Yeah. And you know, 25% of people who have HIV in America right now don't know they have it. So they're not getting any education, any any healthcare. There's a you know the people who are most susceptible to it are those with the, without the education, without the resources. And we have about 1.1 million Americans right now living with HIV. Um, 35 million people globally, most of them in Africa, which is of course why you're not seeing it on the evening news because you know that if that were Europe, it would be on the news. Um, and the same thing happening here. I think that racism has taken over from where homophobia left off, if it ever left off, which it hasn't really. Um, and yeah, we're talking largely about black and brown populations in Atlanta, in DC, um, and people without 
access to education on this, people without access to insurance and the healthcare that makes this the manageable disease that a lot of people think it is. I, you would be amazed the number of times I've been at some random cocktail party at a literary festival or something and someone says, well, what did you write about? And I say, oh, this book about AIDS. And they go, isn't it great that it's been cured? Uh -huh. I go, yeah, but it hasn't. And they go, yeah, no, it has because Magic Johnson. Oh. Oh. It's happened to me like 15 times in the past year. It's staggeringly ignorant. I'm gonna pass this over to you now though. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate you naming racism because mm -hmm. for me too, when I look at the global epidemic and Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia are much more impacted by AIDS right now mm -hmm. and that's about a lot of other layers. Um, mm -hmm. And in this country, like we do have really great healthcare and med coverage. There's no reason, that's free. Like there's no reason if somebody has HIV other than access yeah. Um, that they can't get connected to medical care. Obviously, state to state is different, and Vermont is knocking it out of the park. Um, but we're in a new age, too, where undetectable, so somebody that's taking their medication, you are suppressing your viral load, and you're not going to pass HIV on. That is very new, that the world is behind the science. So there's no shame and fear that a lot of people were steeped in by medical providers and just the fear of getting tested of what then is my responsibility to my body and my partners yeah. if I do know. The safest person to have sex with is someone who has HIV and knows it and is taking medications taking medication. to make themselves undetectable versus the general population mm -hmm. of which a certain percentage are positive and don't know it and aren't taking treatment. Totally, and we're, we're beyond the days of PrEP being used for those serio-discordant couples where, like my partner, I wouldn't recommend my partner to be on PrEP because I'm medicating HIV. So the risk between me and my partner is not there because of my medication. Five, 10 years ago, we were saying, your partner should be on PrEP too. If you're playing with other people, it's a different situation, but things are moving really fast with the science. But again, what's not moving is all that power between us. Like to talk about HIV, to get it on people's radar, to talk about sex and drugs together. Like we're not having these conversations yeah. all the time still, or we're so misinformed or disinformed or uninformed. So I really believe like we have the power to attack stigma in that that's about our assumptions and our beliefs. And discrimination is happening. I don't know how many folks know that the Red Cross mm -hmm. totally discriminates mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. against gay men giving mm -hmm. blood. Okay. Talk about bringing ACT UP into the streets. They mm -hmm. were just doing a huge blood drive in the middle of City Hall in Burlington, literally the day before we were on Church Street testing, which Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman came out for. And it's just unreal, the disparity of mm -hmm. visibility for the work and people's lives. Like, blood draws are great. And people need health care. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, um, and not to bring everyone down, um, our administrator in charge of the country, um, 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 between Christmas and New Year's of 2017, um, fired all the remaining members of the HIV AIDS Advisory Council and then pulled out of global AIDS spending um, in a way that the the estimate is that it probably is gonna result in at least a million pre preventable deaths. Um, that is, at the same time, paying all this lip service to if there's something like, oh, we're gonna end AIDS by 20 something, like, great. Um, there's, you know, I think, not that mandate on the national level that they're only briefly, only kind of maybe was um, this moment where, um, you know, Clinton kind of sort of was brought around. Um, it's, it's it, it, people in power understand that they can ignore this with little effect. Um, you know, in a way that 20 years ago, they would have, they would have faced the music a little bit more, if not entirely. Um, so we're back to grassroots, is what that means. I mean, until we can, until we can do better in higher offices, we are, we are back to grassroots, which the good thing is we know that that can work, um, to be a flagrant optimist. 
which I'm not really, but, but we, know that the, we know that that works. We know that direct action works, we know that grassroots works. Um, and in a place like Vermont, and what I see in Chicago, um, the, the organizations that started you know, out of someone's apartment in the 80s, so many of them are still going. Um, this one, just to, I'll tell you a happy story now because I just mentioned um, someone unpleasant, so I'll tell you a happy story, which is that um, uh, when this book first came out, I was doing a donation campaign um, that I managed to get all these bookstores to match when we got a lot of money to this one organization, this tiny organization in Chicago. Um, there's this woman named Lori Cannon who she started as an activist because she was a bus driver and she worked for a charter bus company in Chicago. And Chicago House, which was an AIDS hospice organization, used to hire these charter buses to take men to movies and stuff. And the charter bus company figured out what was happening and were like, no, 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 we can't do that. So she started stealing the buses <laughs> at night to take these men to movies because she'd been very become very close to some of them. And then she became really involved in ACT UP, and she was out there. I've seen videos of her getting arrested in the streets. She's like this loud, awesome woman with like spiky red hair. And then eventually she started this organization called Open Hand, which is mentioned briefly in The Great Believers. It's um, an organization that was bringing groceries and um, prepared meals to people's homes. And at a certain point, she turned that into this more of a grocery store food pantry on the north side of Chicago for people living with HIV. And I had been introduced to her, and I asked her if I could talk to her. And she goes, yeah, no, we can talk. I want you to come meet me at the grocery store. And you need to come meet me on Wednesday, because the store is closed on Wednesday, so I need to be there. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. So I meet her at the closed grocery store on Wednesday. And she sits down with me, and she's like, OK. And we're in this little like front seating area. And she goes, yeah, so I need to be here, because a lot of my boys have dementia. Because you know AIDS-related dementia, for those especially who've been living with it for a long time, is a very real problem. And she goes, yeah, a lot of them have dementia, so they don't know that it's Wednesday. So I need to be here to tell them that it's Wednesday and we're closed. And sure enough, as we sat there, like four or five people came in, not knowing that it was Wednesday. And so she welcomed them in told them that it was Wednesday and they were closed and then gave them food anyway <laughs> and then sent them away and told them to come back the next day. <laughs> like this this is who this is who's doing this stuff. This is, you know, she's someone who just she was drafted. She feels like there's a higher purpose to her involvement in this. She feels like this was just a calling for her, that she was chosen, that she's a chosen survivor. And um, you know, she's gonna be there every Wednesday forever. And um that, you know, those, those organizations are around, those survivors are around, those allies are around now. Um, their stories are, you know, are ones we need and those organizations are the ones we need to keep supporting because we're not, it's not gonna come from the top down. So, should we do one last question? Is that about, does that sound good? Yeah, you had one, yeah. So, um, I, I've read about two thirds of your novel and I'm liking it a great deal, I think it's great. I'm confused about the title, though. At, at two-thirds of the way through, I don't know why it's called... You skipped the epigraph. <laughs> no, I'll tell you. It's a great way to end. To her, to her. Everyone dies. I skip epigraphs. The only time I don't skip epigraphs is when I'm listening to an audiobook, and they'll start with some great sentence, and I'm like, this is great, this is going to be great, and then it's like... That was from Shakespeare. <laughs> and then they launch it, right? <laughs> like, oh, never mind. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, when I, this is actually a great one to end on. Um, when I was researching... Never mind. No, 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 it, of course, it turned out to be way easier to find information about the art world of 1920s Paris. Books upon books upon books of biographies of artists, and it was there for the picking. Um, and so that's what I started with as I kind of put out feelers to figure out what I could about 1980s Chicago. Um, and I was reading this lovely book called Flappers, Six Women of a Dangerous Generation by Judith McCrell. Um, and it's six women. It's like um, Isadora Duncan and Zelda Fitzgerald. And uh, at some point in this book, it has this mention of F. Scott Fitzgerald talking about his generation and saying we were the great believers. 
And I thought that was so odd. Um, you know, this generation that I was educated to regard as very cynical. Um, and when I looked at the full quote and the full essay it was from, which was a posthumously published essay, but about his generation, it turns out that the quote was very much about um, his generation before World War I. These young men who had gone into the war um, with this sense of sort of American destiny and their own sense of greatness, um, and then they were horrendously disillusioned, right? Um, and I started thinking about the generation specifically of, of um, visual artists, of painters, who came to Paris before World War I uh, because it was the age of the art academy. Um, sometimes we refer to that group of um, artists as L'Ecole de Paris, but um, Modigliani, Soutine, Fujita. Um, and they were coming to Paris from everywhere around the world, penniless, um, living in little hovels, burning furniture for warmth, and finding chosen family and making art. And then World War II and the influenza of 1918 rolled through and decimated that generation largely of its young able-bodied men. And it was in the aftermath of that that the American writers we think of, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, etc., go to Paris. And that's when Gertrude Stein says to Hemingway, you are all a lost generation. And the parallels between that and the AIDS generation of a city like Chicago where people were coming from all over because it was this mecca, it was this place where they could come make their art or just live their lives. They weren't all artists, of course. Um, they could find chosen family. They could find happiness. And then the way that epidemic rolled through and then the 20 to 30 years of relative aftermath that we've been living in as much as this is still an ongoing crisis, um, those parallels struck me in that moment. And I felt like this was where I had my novel. Um, and I'll, so this is maybe how we'll end. I will read you the epigraph of the novel, which you have to, I know, I know. Um, it's in italics, everyone skips italics, that's the problem. <laughs> but the full quote is, we were the great believers. I have never cared for any men as much as for these who felt the first springs when I did and saw death ahead and were reprieved and who now walk the long stormy summer. Uh, the, second, the second epigraph is from a contemporary poet um, from Chicago named Rebecca Hazelton, and the quote is, the world is a wonder, but the portions are small. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those two things were kind of my guiding light. My joke is that I'm trying to trick you into thinking it's a Bible study book, <laughs> so that like, your Aunt Janice will pick it up, and then... Uh... <laughs> so I'm sure that's like half of you are here, and you're the whole time you're like, oh my god, get me out of here, I thought this is a Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for coming. Kelly, thank you so much.